Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. I've been asked to serve as your interim pastor, and I pray that he'll enable me to do so in a way which will benefit you and be honoring to his name. Assuming the duty of this office, I want to talk to you this morning about four things which all men and women think they know, but only a handful really understand. I want to say a few things about the days ahead for this assembly. Talking about days of light, days of regeneration, days of service, days of commitment, days of walking with Him, the days that lie ahead. And then the church itself as an assembly and the primary duty or ministry of the church, and the faith of those who themselves are living stones who make up this church. He didn't say it is built. He said we are built. Isn't that what he says back there in Ephesians 2 toward the end of the chapter? We are built upon the foundation of the prophets and apostles of Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. And all this building, fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. Let's read together the first six verses of Ephesians chapter 3. For this cause, what cause? What cause? For this cause. That is the building of God's church, the calling out of His elect. For this cause... I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. What's he talking about there? He wrote this from prison. But he didn't say, I'm a prisoner of Rome. He said, I'm a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in other places, he talks about him being made a prisoner of Jesus Christ as an open door. That he preached to the jailers, he preached to the people in charge of the prison, and even under the magistrates that put him in there. God opened that door. He didn't see that as a curse, he saw that as a blessing. He saw that as a part of this ministry. I'm a prisoner, he said, of the Lord Jesus Christ. He ruins things. He ruins providence, not me. And if he's made me a prisoner, I'm his prisoner. If he's made me a free man, I'm his free man. If he's made me a servant, I'm his servant. All that we could get a handle on that. I'll tell you, our lives would change, wouldn't they? I'm a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four and few words, whereby when you read you might understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages, that is times past, was not made known unto the sons of men as it's now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Now, in the light of these verses, let's talk a little bit about these days ahead. You and I are living in the last days. I hear a lot of talk by preachers on the radio and TV about the last days, and and they look ahead and and say, we're we're coming up on the last days now. You you keep your eyes open, you're going to see some things, and now you know you're going to be... It's been the last days since Christ appeared on this earth. John tells us as clearly as any apostle, as any preacher in the Bible, John says, little children, it is the last time. So I don't have to speculate about whether or not I'm living it at the end of time. I'm living in the last days. John said, little children, it's the last time. It's the last time. 
And as we've been told that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists. And there shall be even more. We're living in the last days. And it's been the last days since Christ appeared in Bethlehem's manger and then died on that cross. Paul tells us in Hebrews 9.26, But now once, now listen, in the end of the world, not in the middle of it, in the end of the world, hath Christ appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. We're living in the last days. And the last days are often referred to by preachers of days gone by as the gospel age. I like to call it the gospel age. And We had a young visitor at the at the Bible conference down there and he overheard me telling somebody about the last days and the gospel age and he said, whoa, wait a minute. He said, what are you talking about gospel age? And I said, well, Paul said there's never been an age when the truth of God was made known unto men as it is now in Christ. Now hath Christ appeared. You know that scripture I quoted to you over there in, in 2 Timothy 1, nine. Read verse 10. Now it's manifested by the appearing of our Savior. All this grace, all this eternal grace and this eternal covenant, this, our eternal assurance, this is all manifested in our Savior. who brought he, he abolished death and brought life and immortality to life through the Gospel. He is the Gospel. And we're living in the Gospel age. Now, let me say this. Before somebody goes home and says, well, he's saying there's no gospel in the Old Testament. I'm not saying that. That's not what I'm saying at all. The gospel is as old as God. You know, in Revelation uh, chapter 14, verse 6, it's called the everlasting gospel. This gospel, this gospel was manifested clear back in eternity before ever this world was made. Is Christ not called in Revelation, I think it's chapter 5 or chapter 6, He's called the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. This Gospel is as old as God. And if I were pressed to give a definition of the Gospel, what do you call the Gospel, preacher? you say saying these men don't preach the Gospel. What are you talking about? Christ is the Gospel. I don't, I don't care how many points you got. I don't care how much facts you got. I don't care how much doctrine you've learned. If it's not included in Christ, it's not the Gospel. Christ Himself is the Gospel. There's no hope apart from Him. There's no salvation apart from Him. None other name given among men whereby we must be saved except Christ the Lord. That's it. Paul said, God forbid that I should preach anything or know anything except Christ and Him crucified. There's nothing else worth knowing. And he said this. He said, It's now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the Gospel. Whereunto, he said, I'm appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. In this age of light, and that's what it is, it's the Gospel age, it's, we have more light than any writer. You go back and read these old writers and you say, Oh, they were so learned. Maybe they were, but I'm telling you this. You live in an age where there's more light than any other age that's ever been. Those old men had to learn, they had to learn German just to read the books that other believers had written. They had to learn Latin. They had to learn Hebrew. They had to learn all of these languages just so you read these men, you say, boy, they were intellectual. They had to be. But not today. Today you just hit a button. There it is. There it is. You want to hear a sermon? Click. There it is. You want to know something about a doctrine? Click. Here it is. I've got a thing. I'm, I'm, when my computer shuts down, I'm dead in the water. My whole library is on that computer. And it, it's been put on there in such a way that you can search it. So if I'm talking about faith, I don't have to read every book that was ever written on faith. I just hit faith. 
and it calls to me the, the, the portions of those men's writings that discuss this fact. And I can go in there and I can never been an age like this. Never been an age like this. Most folks know that Jesus was born. He celebrated as the Christ and that time itself is hinged on His appearance. But they have no clue as to who He is. Who is this man? Why did He come? What was His purpose in coming into this world? Why was He born in a cow stable in Bethlehem? Because that's where the prophet said He was going to be born. And God told them. Why did He do this? Why did he do... Where is He now? What happened to Him? He rose from the dead. Where did He go? He ascended. He's at the right hand of the Father. What's he doing up there? Making intercession for the saints, ordering all things, arranging all things that his elect be called. There was a day when you and I lived in a, we lived our lives in ignorance and darkness and unbelief. That light's described in Ephesians two, verses two and three. He said, You walked. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein you walked according to the course of this world. You walk just like every other blind man out here walk, dead in trespasses and sin. You walk according to the course of this world. Not only that, but you that were in religion, you walked according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now worketh in the children of disobedience. He manipulated you and you didn't know it and you were used to Him and rejoiced in His doctrines and followed His teachings and and some of you even held offices in churches. How's that described? <laughs> to those who are dead and trespassed and sin, walking according to the prince of the power of the air. And were by nature, are you listening? Were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Just as fallen as that old dead bone in the nose native over in deepest, darkest Africa. Dancing around a totem pole. You down here in the church dancing around your totem pole. They're over there in the jungle. But you both worshiping idols. Joe likes that saying Brother Mahan has and Brother Don uses all the time about playing in the sandbox. <laughs> That's what they do. They dance around in their sandbox. Moses come down off the mountain and here's all Israel. They... They saw the power of God, the grace of God. They saw the waters parted. They themselves walked across that sea on dry land, watched God fold that water on top of Egypt and destroy them. Preserved them in that wilderness. Moses went up to receive God's law and he come back down. They talked Aaron into making a golden calf and they were dancing naked around a fire. That's what, that's what folks do when God leaves them alone. That's what they do. They find a, a God that appeals to them. They find a church that appeals to them, a religion that appeals to them. And if they get settled in that thing, that's where they're going to stay the rest of their life and be satisfied with it and teach it to their children and their children's children. Unless God intervenes. Unless He intervenes. We didn't know anything about God's redemptive purpose, or I didn't, or the means ordained to save His elect, or the very age in which we lived. I didn't know I was a Gentile. I was 30 years old before I realized I was a Gentile. You know what that is? A heathen. A heathen. I found out in the Scriptures I was a heathen. I didn't know God. I had no connection. Paul reminds them here in Ephesians 1, he gets down here and he said that in time past you were without Christ being aliens. You didn't have any promises. What promises have you got? Those promises were given to, to Israel. Those promises were given through Abraham. Those promises was given through Moses. What right have you got to those promises? I'll tell you, you learn something when you read the Bible. And when God opens your heart to understand it, you learn you were a heathen. That's exactly what you were. 
We didn't know anything about worshiping God or praying to God. We, we thought going to God in prayer was a shopping list. But my friend, we're living in, a, in the day of great light, great and clear revelation. No other age since the beginning of time has had the Gospel preached unto us, them like it's been preached unto us. And this faith we have, uh, which the prophets spoke, uh, Peter said they inquired diligently. Diligently searching water, what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the suffering of Christ. Now listen, and the glory that should follow. We're living in the days of the glory which shall follow. Are we not? Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them who have preached the gospel unto you by the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Oh, what a privilege we have. What a privilege we have. My friend, your calling is not just to escape hell or an open door into heaven should you die. We're called to be heirs of God. Think about it. Heirs of God. How do we we get to be heirs? He predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. Why, Why did God choose you? Why did God choose me? Of all the people in this world, why would God choose me? This ignorant heathen who lived his whole life in rebellion, why would God choose me? Because it's according to the good pleasure of His will. And it's according to the purpose of His grace. And that's just the kind of people He chooses. Huh? Paul said, you see your calling, brethren. Not many wise men. Not many mighty, not many noble are called. An old Queen of England said she thanked God for an uh, for an M. He said that could have been not any noble, but it don't say that. It said not many noble. But God has chosen the weak things of the world. He's chosen ignorant men like myself, unlearned men. Somebody come to visit our church and went home and told her husband said, well, he hadn't been to seminary. Who does he think he is? They shouldn't call them seminaries. They ought to call them cemeteries. But they ought to call them. It's not due. We're called to be heirs. Heirs of God. Sons by adoption. Fellow heirs with God and Christ. And there's no other reason for us to be in this world right now If you're here this morning and you're a believer, you've embraced Christ with all your heart. You rest in Him. You've entered into that rest. You understand. You see that all-sufficient grace in Him. Why are you still here? You you gonna get holier? I don't know. That's not been my experience. You you look at Paul's testimony of himself as as he aged. It just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Finally, at the end, he he calls himself the chief of sinners. Oh, he said, wretched man that I am. Huh? That sounds like somebody's growing uh, more and more holy. No. No. You're as fit by the work of Christ, by virtue of His righteousness and His shed blood, you're as fit for glory right now as you're ever going to be. So why don't God just take us into glory? Why are we still hanging out in this world? Why are we still here? Because God purposed to use His people as fellow laborers to call in His elect out of this world. I can't find another reason in the Scriptures for us being here. You look if you will. I can't find anything. This is why we're here. So what do we do? We do everything in the world except that. Huh? I was so pleased last night as I was talking to Joe and 
and he couldn't sit down anymore. He was so excited he got up and he said, you know, I get it. I finally, I get it. I get it. And that's the way it is. When, when you fully understand, this is the only reason for me being here. And if this be the reason why I'm here, why don't I put my hand to the task? Why don't I? My soul, what a privilege. God allows us to be a part of the calling out of His elect. Can you imagine? One of my sisters told me, she said, uh, so you're happy down there, huh? I said, yeah, I am. They all treat me like I'm mentally incompetent and they always pat me on the head and pity. And they said, so you're happy down there? I said, yeah, I am. And, uh, okay, well, is anything going on? I said, not a lot. Not a lot. You had... You baptized many? I said, no, I haven't baptized anybody in a while. Uh, one fella and his daughter. Okay, you know, and that, that's, the way they, that's the way they see us. I don't see it that way. This is the highest privilege God could lay on a person. Called him as a fellow heir and gave him the highest privilege in the world that he be a part of that labor of the calling in of his elect. All my soul. Once you get that in your heart, I'll tell you, just to give one of, another believer a drink of water in his name. Huh? Just to speak a word of comfort in season. Just to be able to, to pray for them and, and see their faces and and understand what God's doing. That's everything. I can't imagine a higher privilege than that. Took this old sinner, this old rebel sinner, and appointed him to the highest position in the church in our day as a preacher. You think I don't feel unworthy of that? Oh, my soul. But what a privilege. What a privilege. And if I could exhort you with anything, I would exhort you with that. For the love of Christ, think about what a privilege if God raises up a church here that He's given to you. No higher privilege anywhere. No higher privilege. And then the second thing I want to talk to you about this morning is the church. We know that the church in its fullness is made up of every chosen man and woman from Adam to the last saint called into his kingdom. I've got no problem with that. Every believing saint is a member of that church and a recipient of all the blessings of the Father given to him through his Son. But on this earth, his church is known or manifested in local assemblies. You read the book of Revelations? And the very first thing he tells you, he said, I'm speaking to the seven churches which are in Asia. He didn't say, I'm speaking to my church and just let it go where it will. He said, I'm speaking to seven churches. Now, if he speaks to those seven churches, he's speaking to the whole church. But that's not how he identifies them. He identifies them as these seven churches. How many churches does he have today in the world? I have no idea. But I do know this. When he speaks, he'll speak through those churches. Everything he's got to say to men, he's going to say through those churches and men sent out by those churches. That's how he speaks. It's just so. Listen to this. Paul addressed his epistles to the church of God which is at Corinth. You talking about a troubled church? A church full of problems? But I tell you this, it was his church. It was his church. And even that man that they found sleeping with his stepmother, oh, what a shame on that little church. Even that man, by the grace of God, was restored back into fellowship of that church before things were done. His church. This is the church of God, which is at Corinth. He, he calls them, he writes this book of Galatians, to the churches in Galatia. There were seven. To the church 
of the Thessalonians. And then speaking of Priscilla and Aquila, these two friends that, that Paul had and fellow laborers and helpers with him, gave him a place to stay, gave him some food to eat, welcomed him into their home. He, speaking of Priscilla and Aquila, he sends his greetings to the church that was in their house. Isn't that something? God's church. God's church. And though these churches are sometimes small in number, they're to be considered exactly as His church in its fullness. All one in Christ, all one in doctrine, all one in the unity of the Spirit. Look, look with me across the page here at Ephesians chapter 4. He said in verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. He's not talking about preachers here. He's talking about you and you and you. Believers in Christ. And that word vocation actually means calling. I, I, I can't really tell you why he uses the word vocation there, but he said, I beseech you that you walk worthy of the calling wherewith you're called. That is to the purpose and end of your calling, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another. You know what that means? Putting up with. <laughs> the people I pastor put up with me, and I put up with them. Forbearing one another in love. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The unity of the Spirit has to do with our union with Christ and it, it consists of both doctrine of Christ and the fruit of such doctrines in those which believe. And he says there's just one body. Just one body. One Spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. His churches. His churches meaning his local church, and he calls them candlesticks. I'm just barely old enough to remember what candles were used for. They only had one purpose. We didn't cook on them. Couldn't eat them. They used for light. Electric could go off back in the early 50s and mom would get out the candle and light the candle. Or she'd take that oil lamp and light it up, and we'd have light in the house. He calls his churches in Revelation chapter 1 candlesticks. Candlesticks. And I tell you, some of you have been around here, been looking, and you've been looking for a while, and you hadn't found any light. This may be the only source of light in this whole area. Could be. Could be. The only source of light. His candlestick. You wonder what you're doing sometimes. This little group, we come together, we meet, we watch videos, we have a man down occasionally to preach to us. What's the purpose? Light. That's the purpose. Light. Now, let me show you something along these lines you might never have considered. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. He said, if we say we have fellowship with Him, and He describes Him, in Him is light and no darkness. And if we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie. God's people have light. Brother Mahan used to use this. Some religious friend of his decided he was going to convince Brother Mahan that they were all right even though that everything they said was at opposite ends, he was going to convince him that all these religions were right. And he told him, he said, now listen to me. He said, he said salvation is like a large gray elephant. And he said, and we're all blind. And he said, one preacher has a hold of his tail, and another preacher has a hold of that big leg, and another one has a hold of his trunk. And they're all telling you exactly what they feel. But they're all describing something different and yet the same. And Brother Mahan said, well, I've got two things wrong with that. He said, all right, go ahead. 
He said, number one, salvation doesn't have anything in common with a large gray elephant. And number two, God's people are not blind. They have light. God has shined. He commanded His light to shine into the heart the same as He did in creation. He did that in the new creation and He shined that light to give the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. His people have light. They see. They see. You're not going to convince them otherwise. They see. I can see. Now, blind man, he might try to... I, I, think about old blind Bartimaeus sitting there on a the blanket. And that road through Jericho led to the sea. And then going the other direction, it led up to the mountains. And people come by and they start talking about them snow-capped mountains and they start talking about those clouds in the sky and then they start describing the sea and its aquamarine colors and the fluffy cloud floating, you know, all this kind of stuff. Blind boy, man, as blind as he could be. He didn't know what they were talking about. He could talk about it, but he couldn't see it. God opened his eyes. Don't you know, for the first time in that man's life, he knew exactly what them people were talking about. Uh, that's the way it is. God opens our eyes. He gives us light. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love it. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And now you see things that these old prophets couldn't even see. Oh, we have light. We have light. But if we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, walk in those lies, go along with all that junk, and do not, we do not the truth. But, now watch this. If we walk in the light as He is the light, can you do that? Can you walk in Christ? If you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. If we walk in the light, as He is the light, now listen to this, we have fellowship. What's that? That's fellows in the same ship. We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. Alright, here's the third thing. That's the church. That's what it's all about. We're one. We believe the same things. We preach the same things. We know the same one. The same Spirit teaches us. And this is what I don't understand about preachers who go off and these men preaching lies and, and, and try to say that we have fellowship. I don't have any fellowship with them. We're not in the same ship. We're not, we don't even worship the same God. Let alone preach the same salvation. We have fellowship one with another if we walk in the light as He is the light. And then here's the third thing. The ministry of the church. They're all going to gather here to what end? What are you going to do if the Lord comes along in about three weeks and starts adding members to this? Six months from now, you've got twice as many people in here. Six months from now, a year from now, we baptize four or five more, six more. All these families come in. I had a half a church full of people walk in on me one Sunday. About a third of them stayed over a church split. And they didn't know where to go. But they knew one of our members and they said, come over here. So they said, okay. The whole church drove over there an hour from where they lived. Drove over there and heard the gospel. About a third of them did and stayed. They stayed. So what is the ministry of the church? What are we going to do? What's the primary work of the church? What's its primary function? I hear people talking about ministries, bus ministries. I'm going to start a bus ministry. I have a music ministry, somebody told me. Camp ministries and hospital ministries. What is the primary ministry of the church? It's the preaching of the gospel. Oh, that God would send you a faithful pastor. And through your support, enable that man to preach the gospel to as many open doors as God will open up for him. 
that's the primary if, if God wants to raise a church up here that's why he'll do it that's why he'll do it and he may save a ton of people in this community or he may just call up a little group and you'll support this man and he'll go out and preach and, and do the work of an evangelist and, and he'll preach to you and feed you and, and that'll be the end of it could be on the other hand he might just save your children he might he saved one of mine. I've got two still walking in darkness, but he saved one. And I tell you this: uh, somebody told old John Newton. He said, uh, "Man, did you hear about old such and such down there in the county of Bass?" He said, "The Lord saved him." He said, "If he saved him, I'll never despair again about the Lord saving anybody." John Newton said, I've never despaired about the Lord saving anybody since He saved me. And that's the way I feel about it. If He can save me, He can save my children. If He can save my children, He can save my grandchildren. The promise is unto you and your sons and as many as the Lord thy God shall call. But if He saves them, I hear is how He's going to do it. He's going to tell you the truth and He's going to put it in your heart to believe it. That's how you want to do it. Nobody's going to be called without the preaching of the gospel because God has from the beginning chosen them to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth whereunto He called you, Paul said, by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. I see His glory, don't you? I see the glory of God in Christ. I've obtained that. I have that. I've embraced that. It's mine. I see it. And not the devils in hell can take it away from you once you see it. And I'll give you another reason. Because it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. That's why. I don't know why we won't start things that doesn't please God when He tells you what pleases Him. Please God through the foolishness of preaching to save them. Oh, we're going to save, we're going to save them this way. We're not, we're not going to save them that way. We're going to save them through the baptismal pool. We're going to sprinkle water on their heads and get them into the covenant. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. I've heard so much junk in my life it makes me nauseous to even think about it. He said the gospel... Are you listening? Romans 1.16 Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Everything that's in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you for the gospel. Are you listening? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. Isn't that what that says? That's exactly what it says. To the perishing, it's foolishness. But unto us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And it's the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God. And because therein, here's what Paul said, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. You want to know what righteousness is? Here he is, right? All in Him. All in Him. I know folks who sincerely desire the salvation of their children and grandchildren, but they refuse to put them in a place where they can hear the gospel. I don't know what kind of reasoning they have, but if I were you, I'd give it up. I'd give it up, and I'd get them as quick as I could to the gospel of Jesus Christ and get them under the sound of it. If God's going to save them, that's how He's going to do it. Oh, but what about my grandchildren? What about all these people back here that I'm leaving behind? God will save them the same way He saved you through the preaching of the gospel. Do you think there's any of God's elect that God's going to spare here in that gospel? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came into this world and walked and could have went anywhere He wanted to, but He said, I must needs go to Samaria. Why? Because one of my elect sitting over there and she's going to come to the well and I'm going to give her the truth and the truth's going to set her free. Huh? Isn't that how it happens? That's exactly how it happens. Oh, I tell you, we we don't want to we don't want to run off somewhere else when God's giving us a light on how He does this thing. Here's where it is. 
God may just raise up a church here and save some people. He could. He could. Paul said, How shall, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I don't care who he is, where he is, or when he lives. If he calls on the name of the Lord, he's going to be saved. But how are you going to call on him in whom you have not believed? And how are you going to believe in him of whom you have not heard? And how are you going to hear without a preacher? And how in the world is he going to preach except God send him? Isn't that what that says? That's what the Holy Ghost says. That's exactly what it says. And I tell you, if that's not your hope in this place, I disband today. And I go somewhere where it is. But if this is your hope, I'd put my all into it. I'd put everything I had into it. I'd give myself to it and spare nothing. Maybe God will put His candlestick right here. And you know in Revelation chapter 1, He calls His, his pastors, he calls His churches candlesticks, He calls His pastors stars. You ever wonder why God calls His pastors stars? I was in the Navy, and I learned something about the ancient Navy while I was in there going through boot camp. And do you know the whole of their dependency back in the day was on the stars? And the funny thing about stars, they never move. They stay right where God puts them. Huh? He fixes them in that spot. And then He allows men the wisdom to find their direction by the stars. Isn't that something? Stars. He said, that's my pastors. They're stars. My churches are the candlestick. Here's my stars. Do you know what he calls false preachers? Shooting stars. That's what Jude, that's how Jude described them. Wandering stars. Blaze up in glory for a minute, fade into everlasting darkness. Like the sea, wave come in, hit those rocks, and foam out their shame. That's the false prophet. But not God's stars. God's stars stays right where he puts them. And men look to those stars and they find direction. Find direction. And the third thing about a star is it has light. God given light. And it lights up in the darkness. And you can go out there and it's dark, you can't only see your hand in front of you, and you look up and there's them stars. There's them stars sticking out. Sticking out. All right, before I run out of time, let me just say a word or two about the faith of those who are living stones in this church. Men and women who are members of His church have believed the testimony of God. Did you know that's what the Gospel is? It's the testimony of God. Paul said, I, I thank God for you, brethren. Over there in First Thessalonians chapter 2, he said, I thank God for you, brethren, because when my gospel came to you, it came not in... Uh, he, he said this word, he said it wasn't just the word of a man, but as it is in truth, the word of God. In his stead, Paul said over in 2 Corinthians 5, he said, we are ambassadors and we do beseech you in his stead. God speaks through His preachers. And preaching is not a promotion of private opinion. It's not the declaration of a private interpretation. I hear that from my relatives all the time. That's your opinion. That's your opinion. That's your interpretation. True gospel preaching is the delivering of the testimony of God concerning His Son. I've not told you anything this morning in the Sunday school class or in the preaching of the gospel. I've not told you a single thing that I haven't shown you in the Scriptures. And I never will. I never will. Paul said to the church of Corinth, he said, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. Right now. 
by which also you're saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. And here's what I preached. I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, now listen to me, according to the Scriptures. Boy, there's a big difference. Preachers everywhere talking about Christ died for our sins. But the way they preach, it's not according to the Scriptures. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And He was buried and raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And when I go in there and I see how, why He died and what He accomplished in His death and what He accomplished in His resurrection, now I've got something to build on. Now I've got something to rest in. Now I've got something to understand. I've, I've just got nothing to say to you that's not based completely on the testimony of God, and therefore your rejection of this gospel is calling God a liar. John said, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God, which is what these men bring, is greater. For this is the witness of God, which is testified of, of His Son. And he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. And he that believeth not God hath made him a liar. He made him a liar. Because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. Paul never said, I know your election of God because God sent you a private revelation. And yet thousands of people believe that. He never said, I know your election of God because God gave you evidence through the speaking of tongues. He never said that. Well, what did He say? You read it to us a while ago. He said, knowing your election of God because our gospel came not in word only, but it came in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. And I tell you this, if God ever convicts you of sin, He'll have to convict you of righteousness. He'll have to convict you of it because you're not going to find it in yourself. You're going to find it in Him. Find it in Him. He said, I know your election of God because He came in power and in the Holy Ghost. And then what happened? You become followers. Followers of us and the Lord. You saw us as God's servants. You know, Brother Mahan only comes up about here on me. And the first time I met him and heard him preach, I thought he was about that tall. What causes a man to see that? What causes a man to feel that, that authority and fear of that man? Power of God in him. You recognize him as God's servant, you obey him, and you follow him. You follow him. You follow him in the Lord. Pastors, these pastors that God sends you one, obey them which have the rule over you, he said, who watch for your souls. Now you can gather somewhere and listen to tapes all day, but you have no pastor. Those tapes are not going to watch for your souls. Pastors, watch for your souls as they that must give an account. When? Down at, yonder in the judgment? No. No, that judgment's past for the believer. That's not what he's talking about. We give an account daily, daily, for our ministry. We give an account to Him every day for our ministry. Well, what else do I know about this faith? I know it's men and women who are hungry to hear. They give Him an appetite. When God saves a man, He gives him an appetite for the Gospel and you can't fill Him up. Before God sent him a pastor, I went out to San Diego to that little group, and I'm telling you, I was absolutely exhausted when I come home. They wouldn't let me go back to the motel. They just had, they wanted to hear more and more and more and more, and we sit there all day and pretty soon it's time for church that evening. I get up and preach to them that evening. Next morning, they're ready to go again. And by the time I come home, I was exhausted. That's an appetite for Christ. A few years back, I had a member, he just shows up every now and then. And he came in, he heard me preach, and I touched on something. He said, 
You need to preach on husbands and wives sometime. I said, preached on that Wednesday night and you weren't here. That's where I left it. Uh, you want to hear? Show up. Show up. Say, damn, listen, if you're going to hear anything, here's where you're going to hear. Show up. Those old folks said, well, Christ is down there by the beach. He's down there preaching in a boat. Well, I got some folks here sick. I got some folks here that they need him. They need him. I'm going to take them down there. Take them go down there where he's at. That's the thing to do. And you prayed in your prayer a while ago. God's promise where two or three are met together in my name, there will I be in the midst. Want to hear from him? Show up. Could be he'll speak. Could be he'll speak to you. Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be something? God assured His saints in Canaan. They came up to that Jordan River. It's flood stage. Over its banks. That's a big river. He came up there and He assured them that Canaan was His gift to them. Took them across that river on dry ground. Here they are. They got their swords strapped on and they're scared to death because the witnesses had come back earlier and told them there's walled cities over there, there's weapons of warfare over there like you've never seen, there's army, there's giants over there. Here they come. Swords strapped on the side. Come to the strongest, biggest, boldest city in Canaan. God never let them lift a sword. They surrounded that city and blew on the trumpet and the wall come down. That trumpet's the gospel. It's the gospel. And it don't it don't take the swords. It don't take the spears. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We don't sit around and figure out ways. We know the way. We know the way. But they're spiritual. These weapons are spiritual. And they're effectual to the tearing down of strongholds. Destroying these evil imaginations and these things. They're effectual for that. They're sufficient for that. God often uses a few. I remember when they were taken over Canaan, they went down there and He told them to such and such ones that drink a certain way and such and such ones that do this and do that. And He just kept whittling it down until there was just a handful they were going up against a massive army. He said, now everything's just right. Just right. Could be things are just right right here with a handful. Could be. Could be. Could be God intends to save somebody for the glory of His name. Father, bless the message this morning. Anything that I've said here this morning of myself which might be a hindrance to someone here, please take it away. Reveal to them in their hearts in such a way as to save their souls the glory of God in Christ. Ask it for Christ's sake. Amen.